Morning. John had his finger on the buzzard about 30 seconds ago, so that indicates it's time for us to begin. I am not sure, but Lloyd Westbrook was hospitalized at Marietta Memorial Friday, and I haven't had an update. He's still there, so keep Lloyd in your prayers. And Mary Lou Crumbly, Connie Hauser's mother, is still at Selby. Uh, she's undergoing therapy following a stroke. Sue Butts is at home now, but Sue does not want company. So please respect her privacy. Uh, she's in good spirits and uh, doing reasonably well considering uh, her accident. Continue to keep her in your prayers, and I know she would appreciate your cards as well. We have lots and lots of folks in our area nursing homes, and I'm very pleased that as I visit from time to time, I learn that some of you have preceded me, and your visits are greatly appreciated, probably far more than you realize, and I hope you'll continue to do that. Anita is out this morning. Is the foot doing better? It is. If you missed Anita last week, uh, she was having some issues with that foot she had surgery on. And I didn't see you Sunday morning. Were you here last Sunday morning? I didn't think so. I don't think she was allowed to put any pressure on it at all. But to see her this morning is a good sign. I'm not aware of any other announcements to start uh, at the appropriate time. Kurt, do you have the announcements today, or who does? Oh, it doesn't. You don't need to look now. I just wondered. If Kurt has them, he'll be making them at the 10 o'clock hour, so we will dispense with any further discussion, and uh, David will have our opening prayer this time. Thank you, David. I thought we had a really good weekend last weekend, although I obviously didn't hear Sally on Saturday. I was very pleased by the messages that Harold presented Sunday and was encouraged by all the comments I heard from many of you regarding his messages and from our ladies regarding Sally. And I appreciate all the hard work that went into that weekend, in particular uh, what the ladies did in preparation for their ladies' tea and for our fellowship meal last Sunday morning. Uh, it couldn't, been, couldn't have been better. And given the fact that it was also Mother's Day and a lot of folks were out of town, our attendance was uh, not outstanding, but... Uh, good and we're grateful for that. And I especially appreciate uh, Bev and uh, oh gee <laughs> that awful Bobby Ann for their work uh, setting up and uh, getting things ready for the ladies tea and Tim and Kathy who just take care of all of our fellowship stuff. They order, I probably should say Kathy, orders everything and uh, it just always goes so smoothly, and we don't stop and say thank you nearly as much as we should. So even though Kathy's not in here, uh, Tim will convey that to her. And I realized I did not know that our Bible class and now our worship are all on the Internet for you. And everything I say of a personal nature now is out there for the whole world to hear. So I've got to be a little more careful 
about getting sidetracked. I did want to mention that Michelle's with us today. Miss Kelly is back. And Steve is also home uh, with Dad and looking good. And uh, in less than a month now, Bill Horton will turn 90. And when I came in this morning, I looked at him and said, you look pretty good for an old man of 90, which he does. But you be sure and uh, congratulate him as his birthday approaches. It's June the 15th. Wilma Klein shares that date, though she's a lot younger. And uh, there is, a, I believe, a celebration for Bill's 90th coming up next month. So you want to reserve the 17th of June uh, so that you can share in that celebration. We're looking at Christian apologetics at this hour on Sunday mornings. Our study is based on 1 Peter 3.15. Sanctify the Lord God in your heart. That means to set apart in your heart a special place for God. And be ready always at all times in every environment, in any situation, to give an answer. Uh, the word is apologia in the original. It is the word for defense of your faith. We not only need to know what we believe, but why we believe it. And we need to be prepared to explain to others uh, why we believe what we believe. I heard something fall. I don't know what it was, but I don't think it's anything significant, so don't worry about it. I'll pick it up in about 30 minutes. Can you do that? Can you... When confronted by someone who wants to know, why are you a Christian? Why do you worship the way you do? Why do you believe that there's something beyond this realm? How do you respond? And that's been where we have been in our study uh, from the 1st of January, I guess. And we'll wrap up what we're going to be sharing this quarter, I believe next Sunday morning. It is... A relevant study because we're confronted more and more with people who don't share our faith. When you look around you, church attendance is down nearly everywhere. And people are saying more and more that they don't want anything to do with organized religion and that uh, they can be just as close to God out in the uh, field, uh, swinging a stick at a little white ball or uh, sitting under an oak tree, taking in nature, or floating down the river. Uh, that's really not true. You may feel that way, but the Creator designed worship with a special purpose in mind. And our lives really lack something when we don't follow the instruction of the Creator. And we need to be able to let people know why that is the case. For the last few weeks, we've been looking at inspiration. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 specifically, but this is an idea that is presented to us in Scripture literally thousands of times. In, in the Old Testament, for instance, 2,000 plus times you confront statements like the Lord said, God spoke. Uh, it is a recurring theme that the message of Scripture is the message God wanted to communicate. And when we say that the scriptures are inspired, literally God breathed, we're saying that the book, though written by men, were written by men who were guided by the hand of God or the mind of God, if you please. Now, to what extent is inspiration found in the Bible? First of all, I would remind you that... Uh, the words used are inspired words so that they communicate precisely and exactly the message that God intended to be communicated. When you look at uh, the language of the Bible, Paul argues in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, uh, that the words are not the result of human wisdom. Now, we've already noted that God let the authors utilized their own vocabulary, but obviously guided them so that the record that is revealed is accurate, trustworthy. And uh, things that would be beyond the 
mere capabilities of mortals, uh, the Spirit of God assisted those writers uh, so that the truth could be conveyed. And it's not simply a matter of the words. Uh, it, it's even more precise than that. The tense of a verb has great significance. In the first century, the concept of eternal life was not one that was readily held by uh, the Jewish people. In fact, there was a segment of Jewish society known as the Sadducees who simply said things like spirits, angels, and life after death are impossible. They don't exist. And in Matthew 22, in the exchange between Jesus and and the three leading sects of the first century, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Herodians, Jesus answered their argument when they posed the question, there are seven brothers, and the eldest marries a woman and dies without male offspring. And you know the law. The law said that another brother of this man will take the woman, and the first son conceived and brought into this world will be raised as the son of the deceased man. Well, in the story the Sadducees told, all seven brothers married the same woman and all died without any male offspring being produced. And their question was, well, Lord, uh, whose wife is she going to be in heaven? Now, they didn't believe in a heaven. And they thought they had posed a question that was unanswerable. But it was to them, he said, you do err or err, not knowing the scriptures. In heaven, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels. But to illustrate that there is indeed life beyond this life, he took them back to Exodus chapter 4 and uh, reminded them of what happened between Moses and God in the wilderness when out of the burning bush, God spoke to Moses. Moses wants to know, who are you? And the response was, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jesus uses the tense there of the verb, I am, to demonstrate that there is life beyond this realm. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And he did not say from the burning bush, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That would imply that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had died and ceased to exist. That they had died is indisputable. That they ceased to exist is now undeniable because God is still their God and the tense of the verb, according to the argument Jesus made, has tremendous significance. God did not say, I was, but I am. And if you want to look at a, a passage that has relevance today in terms of New Testament Christianity, go to Matthew 16 and note the promise that is made to Peter upon this rock, I will build my church. Throughout the four Gospels, the church does not exist except in purpose or plan. The church does not come into reality until Acts chapter 2. And so he uses the future tense to illustrate something that will be done at a later date. So the very words are imparted by the Spirit where necessary for clarity. The Spirit guides them into all truth so that they don't have to spend a great deal of reflection in fact, in the promise Jesus made in uh, John 14, 26, 15, 26, and 16, 30, I'm going back to the Father, and when I go back to the Father, He will send the Comforter, who is the Holy Ghost. He will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. That was a promise made specifically to them. It does not work that way today. God has not promised the Spirit to operate in our lives as he did in the first century in the lives of those disciples. But then he guided them in their oral and written presentations so that the truth, the whole truth, 
And as Paul would argue in Acts 20, nothing but the truth was made known. Uh, Further, the smallest parts of words have great significance. In Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said, Think not that I've come to destroy the law of the prophets. I've not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And and goes on to say that uh, heaven and earth may pass away, but not one jot or iota, these are the smallest marks in the writing of the alphabet, uh, will pass away till all the law be accomplished. So even the little minute things have great significance. This is the implication that is conveyed. Now, I will grant you that given the fact that there are many, many, many manuscripts and portions of manuscripts and uh, various writings that contain scripture, that there are discrepancies from time to time between various manuscripts and papyrus and things of that nature. But not in the original, nor do those minor discrepancies, and they're usually, almost exclusively, differences in word order, or the use of synonyms, or misspellings or things of that nature that in no way impact the original intent of the author. It's sometimes argued that the the Bible is a book of a hundred thousand errors. Uh, For those of you who are old enough to remember Life magazine, uh, there was an edition of it that came out many decades ago now on the front cover a picture of the Bible, the book of a hundred thousand errors, and this is what they were focusing in on various spelling discrepancies, word order, thing, things like that. Nothing of any great significance. And the fact that those kinds of things might exist, and we would be surprised if they didn't, didn't given the fact that the Bible was hand copied until the 15th century AD with the advent of the printing press, uh, humans are flawed by nature you would expect those kinds of minor discrepancies. Often a manuscript was duplicated by having a series of scribes sitting at their desk writing as someone reads the text. And that in itself uh, presents some problems. It's really remarkable that there are less, or not more of these rather than less of these, given the way uh, communication of the written word was often done. But to ask the question, do these errors affect the message, uh, look at these examples. Every one of them contains an error, but in none of them do you have any problem at all understanding the meaning of the message. I think you'd get it, without a doubt. These are the kind of errors, by the way, that the critics are pointing at nine times out of ten, in fact, more so than that. Each line has an error, but 100% of the message comes through every time. When people look at me and say, well, you can't trust the Bible, it's a book of errors, I know that they've really not taken the time to figure out what is really being understood. And the fact of the matter is the errors that they're alluding to Uh, in no way impact the message. I think it would probably be more surprising to us if there weren't those kinds of things given the, again, the method of communication. Also, sometimes errors are perceived because of a lack of understanding uh, on the part of uh, those who are studying. So if if you want to really look at the so-called biblical difficulties and comprehend what you're dealing with and how to address them to the critics, uh, realize that a citation need not be an exact quotation. It only needs to be faithful to the original intent of the author. When you look at the New Testament quotations of Old Testament passages, and then you go back and look at the Old Testament passage, they're not always verbatim, word for word. There are a couple of reasons for that. Number one, almost no time in the New Testament is the Hebrew Bible quoted. 
what is quoted by New Testament authors and writers is the Septuagint. And the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible done in Alexandria, probably in the third century BC. And since Greek was the lingua franca of uh, the first century, the language of, of commerce and trade and, and, and in a sense the language of government, it became the language of the common man. First century Palestine, everybody could communicate enough to function in Greek and most had a reasonably good uh, use of the common language of the day, which was Greek, coin Greek, or some pronounce it koine, but it's actually coin Greek. And uh, among Jewish people, they also spoke Aramaic, and there are a number of Aramaic uh, words found in the New Testament. Jesus, on occasion, spoke in Aramaic uh, in his communications, and rather than translate their they're transliterated. I think of, uh, of the words of Jesus to Jairus' daughter, for instance. When you read that, those words are given uh, in, in Aramaic rather than in Greek. But by and large, uh, when it comes to Old Testament quotations in the New Testament, uh, though there is not a word-for-word -word verbatim uh, quote, the meaning, and that's the purpose of the quotation, the meaning always comes through crystal clear. And that's what we need to be concerned with. I know there are times when people get a little critical of preachers. They may quote a passage and, and may leave out uh, a word or two that has no real substance in terms of meaning, and yet brethren will get really worked up. Uh, when that happens, that's exactly what writers in the New Testament did. Because the intent is not simply to repeat what is written verbatim by memorization, the purpose is to convey the meaning of a text. I remember many, many years ago, a preacher in a gospel meeting, the whole meeting essentially stood in the pulpit and just quoted verses. Verses, by the way, that probably half the congregation, if not more, could quote as well, and never really tied anything together. And yes, he preached the word, but I'm not so sure that the word accomplished a great deal uh, because the application and meaning were never discussed. There have been, over the course of human history, people who have memorized the entire Bible and people, by the way, who have memorized the entire Quran. But knowing what is said and knowing what it means are two different things. And the purpose of going to Scripture is not simply to say, here's what it says, but also, here is what it means. And if you have some doubt about that, uh, I would urge you to read Nehemiah with special attention to chapter 8, where all of the people are gathered together, and Ezra mounted a pulpit of wood, and he spoke from the law distinctly and gave the sense... And that's what preaching and teaching is supposed to do. It's just not a repetition of what is written. Although we must always be faithful to what is written, the purpose is to help people understand it. So when you hear people say, well, they don't even quote the passages correctly, they never get the meaning wrong. But they're not as focused on a word-for-word -word literal quotation as much as taking the passage and giving it its proper meaning or application. Further, not everything recorded in the Bible is approved by it. Thirty-some uh, years ago now, when I moved here, I casually said that not everything in the Bible is true. And uh, I said it intentionally just to, to see the response, and the response was from some exactly what I expected. I went on to explain what I meant, but once I said that, they never heard anything else. That's happened to me a lot over the years, and I've had to sit people down and say, let's just listen. And uh, when they listen, well, I didn't hear that. No, you didn't. Because you heard something 
and you stop listening. You jump to conclusions that you shouldn't have jumped to, and it, it happens all the time. Everything in the Bible is faithfully recorded as it happened you can know that the record is trustworthy. But by way of illustration, when you read in Genesis chapter 3, thou shalt not surely die, that statement is accurate, but it's wrong. They ate and death entered the world. You know, if you're a student of the Bible, that those words came from Satan. And as a student of the Bible, you know in John 8, Jesus said that Satan is a murderer and a liar. In fact, he's the father of lies, and in him no truth abides. And so his statement is false, but the record of his having made it is absolutely accurate and precise. Now, in the book of Job, Job experiences great calamity. His is a test case. Can a man have everything in life he values taken from him and still hold to his faith? And Satan argues no, and God demonstrates that he can. In fact, we lost his, his wealth and his family and his health. He never lost his faith. He said, till I die, uh, I'll cling to my faith. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him, Job 13, 15. But... His three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, came to visit him, and for an entire week they sat in silence. And finally the silence is broken, and when the boys are young men or aged men, I really don't know, uh, probably middle-aged like a lot of us, spoke to Job, they said, and I'll just summarize their message, all three of them, Job, your problem is of your own making. Eliphaz said, whoever perished being innocent, you reap what you sow. If you're reaping bad things, it's because you've done bad things. Now, that's exactly what they said to Job. But it wasn't true. What had Job done that brought all of this calamity on him? Absolutely nothing. So they're wrong. The record is right. This is what they argued. But the argument was false. So it's imperative when you study the Bible that you ask who said it, to whom it was said, when was it said, what precedes it, what follows it. And when you do all of that, only then are you really in a position to come to some meaningful conclusion about the message of God. But people... They just don't get it. I was reading this past week, again, an article about uh, the Bible being such an outdated and irrelevant text. And uh, the arguments that the authors were making uh, dealt with uh, the biblical demands for stoning adulterers, uh, capital punishment for uh, uh, failing to respect parents and and fighting holy wars where uh, men, women, and children are all destroyed. And uh, you can't follow the Bible if, if, you know, if that's what the Bible says. That's not right. Well, in the first place, they didn't take into consideration that those are all Old Testament precepts which are overruled by the New Testament. Under the Old Covenant, uh, love your neighbors, hate your enemies was fine. Under the new covenant, it's love your enemies and pray for them. Don't kill them. There's just such a world of difference. But these folks, the critics, do not realize that as Christians, we are challenged to rightly divide or handle or write the word, 2 Timothy 2.15. And so many of the criticism are demonstrations of just sheer ignorance, people who don't differentiate between the Old Covenant and the New and insisting that some Old Covenant concepts which are clearly out of date because they're not repeated in the New Testament make no real sense in, in modern society. I would readily agree it makes no sense today to argue that you can't wear any fabric that is composed of two different elements, polyester and cotton, 
would be anti-God under the Mosaic law, but is irrelevant under the law of Christ. Under the Mosaic, uh, the Mosaic covenant, you could not eat hog, pig, and be faithful to God. But under the new covenant, God doesn't care. Although I did, did just read uh, Friday morning that there's now a Jewish rabbi who argues that for typical Jews, those prohibitions are misapplied. It's fine to eat pork today, that those limitations were only for the priest of the Levitical tribe and didn't have any impact on the whole nation. Of course, he's a lone wolf, so to speak, uh, for literally the entire course of the history of the law given by God through Moses, Israel. It's been understood that pork was outlawed uh, for Jewish people, but it's kind of like Ben Franklin said, when you want to do something, men are reasonable creatures. We can find a reason, technically an excuse, to do it. And he, his own illustration was he had decided to be a vegetarian. But on a journey from um, Boston to Philadelphia, he noted that they were catching cod and filleting them and frying them up and they smelled really good. But he'd given up eating any kinds of meats, including fish. But he said, I noticed as they gutted the fish and prepared them for uh, cooking that inside the bellies of those fish were other fish. And I assumed, you know, if they can eat other fish, why can't I eat them? So from that point on, he was less a vegetarian, and when something appealed to him, uh, he took full advantage of it. And that's out of the context of which he, he concludes that um, we're pretty reasonable people. We can find a reason to do whatever we want. And uh, it seems to me that's what's happening with this so-called Jewish scholar who now wants to say to uh, practicing Jews today, don't pay any attention to those laws they were only for the Levites but misapplication what I can tell you is when you read scripture what the Bible affirms as being true and right and proper is true right and proper and what it says is wrong and sinful it's still wrong and sinful and the reality is in those matters we don't really have a lot of trouble understanding the meaning there are difficult things in this book, and I don't deny that. There's stuff I don't understand. I was, in my just daily reading, just finished uh, Matthew 18. I've gone through the New Testament. I've started in Matthew again. I'm in chapter 18, and Jesus talks about the, uh, the little children. They're angels in heaven. I don't have a clue what that means. Now, I have people tell me that, you know, we all have guardian angels, and if that's the case, some of us got slackers for guardian angels. Wouldn't you agree? They've let us down a lot. I, I, in no way can I find anything that really supports this idea that every person has a guardian, guardian angel looking out for him. But I don't have a clue what Jesus meant when he referred to the angels of those little ones in heaven in Matthew 18. There, there's stuff there that I don't understand. But there's nothing there that is essential, that is the least bit hard to understand. You get it when he says don't lie, don't steal, don't commit adultery. You understand love your neighbor and love your enemy too. May not be easy, but you understand what that means. And even when we come to salvation and worship, what is set forth here is not hard at all to comprehend. The problems come when we try to reconcile what other men say with what the Word says. Or often, in religious circles today, to reconcile what men want to do with, God, with what God wants done. And there's where the problems arise. But just going to the Scripture and seeing what God has said and understanding it is not that hard most of the time. I will acknowledge, as Peter did, that Paul wrote some things that are hard to be understood, that they that are unstable wrestle rest to their own destruction. 
but those are minor issues. Further, a partial report is not necessarily a false one. I've, I've cited here the example of the uh, uh, inscription over the cross. It's recorded in all four Gospels. The record is not identical in terms of the meaning, but the message is. And when you factor in the realization that uh, this sign over the cross was in fact written in three languages, that in itself could dictate variances in how it is interpreted or translated, if you please. But regardless of the wording, the meaning always comes across. Uh, look at Matthew 27. Over his head they put the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, king of the Jews. Mark says it, it, it read, the king of the Jews. Now, does Mark contradict Matthew? Of course not. And then this is the king of the Jews in Luke's gospel. And finally, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. The critics would look at that and say, just fill with mistakes. This can't possibly be God's book. But where are the mistakes? The message comes through each time you walk away knowing precisely what was intended. So there are no contradictions and no mistakes in the record. How do you solve the so-called biblical difficulties? Acknowledge that divergent accounts need not be contradictory. Uh, the story of Jesus and Jericho, as recorded in uh, the Gospels, talks about him going into Jericho and coming out of Jericho and, and they say, well, this can't be. It's one or the other, but it can't be both. But if you know biblical geography in the first century, there were two Jerichos separated by a short distance and you would go out of one into the other, out of one into the other. And what the record does simply acknowledge, in fact, uh, with a greater degree of certainty, their understanding of the geography and what actually unfolded. So what is supposed to be a difficulty turns out to be uh, an enlightening text about the geography of the first century. Different words can have the same meaning and the same word can have different meanings. And the best example of this is in Paul's conversion story in Acts 9 and in Acts 22. Many years ago when I was in India, uh, we did a seminar for uh, all of the India preachers where they were able to ask questions and we were supposed to provide the answers. And this is one that came up then and it almost inevitably comes up with people who want to know what you know or want to put you in a position where you, you may have to say I don't know and, and be somewhat embarrassed. But in the accounts, of Jesus speaking uh, in one those traveling with Paul heard and the other they didn't hear. Now which is it? Well the reality is it happens all the time. Every one of you have done the same thing and you understand the meaning precisely. I don't know how many times my wife has said something to me which I heard but didn't hear. And she'll say a day later, sometimes an hour later, well, I didn't hear that. I just told you. The fault was not with her, by the way. I heard it, but I wasn't listening. You can hear things without hearing them, meaning you can hear them but not understand them. And that's all that the record is saying. They heard noise, but they did not understand what was being communicated. So they heard, but they really didn't hear. That's not a contradiction. But those, again, the kinds of contradictions that are often alluded to. Then you go on to uh, the language about the world is observational. Uh, we speak of the sun rising and the sun setting. Uh, we do that not because it is scientifically accurate, but because it is an observational conclusion. The sun rises in the east and sets in the west. 
And Marietta is situated in such a way, it just really confuses me. It, it's hard for me to picture the fact that that is west, so this is east. And if I want to go to St. Mary's, West Virginia, I go due east. That just does not make sense to me. But if you get on the, the little map and, and look at Marietta and look at St. Mary's, the river takes a huge bend, and St. Mary's is absolutely due east of Marietta, Ohio. Um, it just confuses me. It has nothing to do with the class. I just thought I'd throw that out. Uh, but we believe, and I think correctly so, that ours is a heliocentric rather than a geocentric universe, and that the Earth revolves around the sun. The sun doesn't rise and set. The Earth spins on its axis and revolves all the way around the sun. It takes 365 and one quarter days for the Earth to make that entire circle. And every 24 hours, it spins entirely on its axis, a complete circle. And the perception is that the sun is rising and setting when, in fact, the sun's not going anywhere. We're circling it. Now, I also have in my uh, study a, a book that argues for uh, geocentric and flat earth. Uh, somebody sent it to me a few years ago. Uh, I started to read it and thought, nah, I don't have that much time to waste. Uh, we're pretty confident that the sun doesn't rise and set. But it's not an error to speak in that way. It's an observational thing. I've cited here Joshua chapter 10. When uh, Joshua 9 and 10 unfold, there, there's this really entertaining story about the Gibeonites. The Gibeonites have learned of Israel's victories, and they realize they're toast. If they're attacked, there, there is no way that they can stand against the army of Israel with the God of Israel on Israel's side. So they resolve that they're going to make an alliance with the Israelites. But they can only have alliances with people who come from great distances. Their immediate neighbors were to be destroyed. So the Gibeonites get out their worst clothes and uh, moldy bread and moldy cheese and, and really old water skins and, and worn out sandals and everything's covered with dust. And, they come to the camp of Israel and say, we have come from a great, great, great distance and we want to we wanna have uh, peace with you. And without ever consulting God, Joshua and the Israelites form a peace treaty and swear by an oath to the Gibeonites to honor the treaty. Three days later, it's discovered that they didn't come from very far at all. So having given their word, having sworn in an oath that they will have peace, they have no choice but to honor that oath made in the presence of God. But the Gibeonites will become uh, cutters of wood and toters of water for Israel, but that beat death and they were okay with it. But when the other nations found out what the Gibeonites had done, they formed an alliance and uh, we're going to attack Gibeah. So the Gibeonites called on Joshua and the Israelites to rally to their defense. And they do, and in the pursuing battle, uh, it's going to get late and they're going to have to call off the battle. So Joshua prays for uh, God to extend the day, for the sun to stand still. Now, if you ask me, did that happen? Absolutely. Did the sun literally stand still? Did the earth stop spinning on its axes? Uh, how was this day extended? I don't know. But I know observationally, it was as though the, the sun stood still, the, the day stopped in essence, and light was extended so that they could be more successful in defeating the enemy. I don't have to explain that scientifically to accept it as being an accurate, factual account of events as they appeared to occur in the days of Joshua. I believe that God can interact and intervene in his creation at any time and is not subject 
to the laws of physics as we mortals are. How he would do this, how that was accomplished, I don't have a clue. It was a miracle. Is this technically exactly what happened? The sun stood still? Or is this merely the observation of Joshua and his compatriots of something God did that gave that appearance? There are a few people who think that uh, the earth may have been flipped on its axis and that uh, some things discovered, say, in the region of Siberia may be explained by the events of that day uh, because in that part of the world, even today, animals have been uncovered that were essentially flash frozen. They still had food in their mouths and in their stomachs that was not digested. Uh, something happened that almost instantaneously, instantaneously, thank you, uh, changed the climate because uh, the contents of the mouth and stomach, not materials that would be typically found in that region of the world today, but more uh, true in the tropics. So uh, something really remarkable and phenomenal occurred. I don't know if this had anything to do with that. or I, I don't have a clue. I just know that God can do what God chooses to do. And that doesn't in any way cause me to be suspicious of the scriptures. Next week, uh, we'll look at uh, additional guidelines for solving biblical difficulties and wrap up our study. We may talk a little bit about the canon, how the, the Bible was put together, uh, not by men, but by God, contrary to the argument today that basically says Roman Catholicism chose what books were in and what books were out of the Bible uh, in a council in 397 AD. That, there's no truth to that at all, but it's the commonly held position of the critics. But time's up. We will uh, return to this study, God willing, next Sunday morning. And I dropped one of the portable